Thirteen years ago, we entered into an unusual therapeutic experiment. Three psychologists, Dr. Carl Rogers, Dr. Frederick Pearls, and Dr. Albert Ellis, each conducted three separate therapeutic sessions on film with a client, Gloria, on the same day. Each had a unique orientation, and this film series today has achieved worldwide recognition. I'm Dr. Everett Schostrom, and it's my pleasure to introduce a sequel to this film today. Again, this film features three distinct approaches to psychotherapy with one client, Kathy. In this series, three therapists, each distinguished as a writer and a diplomat in clinical psychology of the American Board of Professional Psychology, will be demonstrating their unique therapeutic procedures. Interviewing Kathy first will be Dr. Carl Rogers, a resident fellow at the Center for the Studies of the Person in La Jolla, California. The book describing his system is client-centered therapy. Secondly, I will be interviewing Kathy, utilizing my system, which I call actualizing therapy. I am director of the Institute of Actualizing Therapy in Santa Ana. The book describing my system is actualizing therapy. Thirdly, Dr. Arnold Lazarus will be interviewing Kathy. Dr. Lazarus is professor in the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. The book describing his system is multimodal therapy. Each therapist will describe his system briefly. He will then demonstrate his work with Kathy and then finally comment on his work. Now here is Dr. Rogers. I want to meet this client as a person and I want our encounter to be that of two persons. I have no desire to have advanced information regarding her. I'll work with whatever she wishes to reveal of herself. It's my hope that I can, first of all, be myself, be present, be real in the relationship. I usually find it easy also to feel a caring for the client, but I can't predict in advance whether I will feel that. I would like to let myself enter into her inner world of feelings and perceptions as accurately and as sensitively as I can. In order to experience that kind of empathy, I'll need to lay aside, as far as possible, my own biases and preconceptions. The extent to which I can do that will, to a considerable degree, determine the progress which she is able to make in the time we have together. I feel I'm a responsible therapist. I'm responsible for doing my best to create a facilitative climate in which she can explore her feelings in the way that she desires, move toward the goals that she wishes to achieve. It's in this deep sense that my approach to therapy is centered in the client, aiming to empower him or her to search out and experience the areas of conflict and or pain, to perceive self in new ways, to choose to follow new options in behavior. If in my own self, I find feelings other than those of caring and of understanding, I'll feel free to express those. But as my own feelings, not as any judgment of or guide for the client. Or, especially on a first interview, I may have no other feelings than a prizing of the client and a desire to indwell in her experience. There's no way I can tell in advance. For me, each encounter with a client is fresh, unpredictable, often enriching to my learning, as well as hopefully enriching the self-learning of the client. So I look forward with eagerness to whatever our time together may bring. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Dr. Rogers. I'm, I'm really glad to meet you. Thank you. And I don't know uh, whether you're feeling a little uptight under these lights and all, but I think I'm feeling a little uptight. I don't think that'll last very long. 
and I have not having met you before, I, I don't have any idea what sort of concerns or issues you might want to bring up, but I'd be glad to hear whatever you want to say. I'm not quite sure where to begin, mm -hmm. but um, some of my um, concerns are um, I have become very much aware since my husband was killed last December. Mm. Um, my own feelings of uh, aloneness. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's directly related to his death because we had been separated for about four years before he was killed. And I, I um, became aware that after he died especially, that he was really very important in my life. I was kind of using him as mm -hmm. a shield mm -hmm. against going out and having other relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now he's gone and I can't use that anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel very, very frightened mm -hmm. of uh, new male relationships. So that in some way, his, his death uh, really made you more aware of the fear you have of of new relationships, especially right. with men. Right, definitely. Mm -hmm. definitely. I didn't have him. To, I didn't have that to hide behind anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a tremendous feeling of loss when he died because I did care for him. Mm -hmm. But um, in going out with other men lately, I just have this feeling of. Uh, it's very strange, and I'm very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that it's um, that the feeling you have is something more than just the loss of him. It's a it's a different feeling of feeling uneasy or yes, scared yeah, or yeah. unsure. For a long time, I didn't feel like going out, and that was fine. You know mm -hmm. that I was uh, going through my my loss mm -hmm. of of him, and so mm -hmm. that was all right. I didn't uh, push it or anything. But just recently, I've started going out, and I've been aware for years of how lonely I am. I have been very, very lonely. I haven't been dating very much for the last four years, mostly just working and taking care of the kids. And um, I, I think I'm keeping myself in kind of like a, a no-win situation mm -hmm. where I'm really lonely, and yet... It's kind of like I'm keeping myself there because I'm, I've got a guard around mm -hmm, me, mm -hmm, and I'd like to kind mm -hmm. of break out of that. Mm -hmm. It's I as though you're in some way sort of responsible for your loneliness. Yes, I know that. I'm very, I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's something you'd like to, you'd like to break out of that shell or that, that safeguard that you've been hiding behind. Part of me does. Part of you does. Okay. Okay. Part of me says no, no. way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it really is a very ambivalent two-way thing. I suspect it's been pretty comfortable um, behind that safeguard. It's more of a risk if you break out. Is that part of it? I I can almost. Well, I'm going to say I can almost go back to the point where I really built up that safeguard in me when my marriage was going bad over five years ago. And I could feel myself, and I know I did. I withdrew, and I've been withdrawn ever since. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's kind of like uh, no more. I don't want any more hurt. Uh -huh, uh -huh, so. uh -huh. mm -hmm. It's just too damn risky taking the possibility of being hurt again. And you've withdrawn from that for a long time. Mm -hmm. See, and I've been aware of this for a long time, too. Mm -hmm. But I never go beyond the awareness level. So the knowledge isn't new. It's the uh, question of what you do about it. That's, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. How can one stay safe and still be open? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the way you shake your head makes you feel, I don't see any way. 
I don't. I really don't. If I did, maybe I, I probably would have done it a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But I don't. It just seems kind of unanswerable to, to be open with a person and yet feel safe. I, I think I'm a pretty open person to begin with. And uh, everything is fine in a relationship as long as the focus does not turn on to me. I see, I see. If you can keep the focus on the other person, you're okay. That's right. And the focus on me up to a certain level, but not in a romantic kind of mm -hmm, a, mm -hmm, a way. Mm -hmm. A friendship, mm -hmm. I would value that. Mm -hmm. But love, you want to keep that's that right. at arm's length. But you know, that's important, though, because um, if a person doesn't want to really be your friend, how can you have him for a lover? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No way. I'm not quite sure I get that. You mean friendship is a necessary first step? Is that what you're saying? Or? Yeah. It is for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've gotten to the point where I won't go beyond. Uh-huh. That's what I was sort of thinking. <laughs> you've, I've got you've, you've thought your way this far, but then where do you... I laid the cards out. Mm -hmm. And that's all I want to play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that in this relationship, it's like in your other relationships. That's right. It goes so far, then let's stop as far as I want to go. Hmm. To go any further is a risk, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I think your eyes tell me you're feeling that risk right now. So here I am. I feel like saying to myself, well, you got this far, it's not so bad. <laughs> 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 it's all right. Make it's a right joke up, out of it. It's all right up to this point. Yeah, right. So let's laugh it off. Yeah, make a joke. Mm -hmm. Talk about something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'd be very easy to run away from yourself. Isn't it? See, but that's it. I made a bargain with myself two parts. The part that understands and it's all right, and the other part that's scared silly. But the part that understands isn't going to force the part that's scared mm -hmm. when it's safe enough. Mm -hmm. Be kind to myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You'll let the scared part come out when, when you're ready for it. When, when, when you the feel scared part feels ready. Mm -hmm. It's as mm -hmm. if part of me's in a cave, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. away from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. But it's cert I certainly can't come out of that cave unless I know that it's all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That there won't be a lot of pain to greet me. Mm -hmm. What's the sense in coming out? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So it's up to the rest of me to make sure that there are nurturing people around mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And when you feel safe enough, either in this relationship or with other people, then you can let yourself come out of the cave and let the scared part of you emerge. Mm. Oh, that's right. That's why, that's why I value the friendships with men mm -hmm. and with other people. I mm -hmm. don't care for the rest. Mm -hmm. Not to say that I don't need it. Mm -hmm. I do. But I need the friendship and the safety and the security of that first. I am... Um, I took a trip not too long ago, and I met a man who I had known years and years ago, only very briefly. And I met him again, and I went out with him, and he was such a lovely person, a kind person, and a very, a very good person. Anyway, it was in the mountains, and as I was driving back from his, um, his home, looking at the mountains, I, I had this feeling, it's kind of funny, it's, I haven't read the Carlos Castaneda books, but I know the concept of mm -hmm. the third eye, mm -hmm. and I was feeling as I was driving through those mountains that now it's all right mm -hmm. for my third eye mm -hmm. to come out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to be able to perceive, mm -hmm. and I felt so good, but when I came back home, I've kind of busied myself with, with working on the house and that kind of thing, and and I'm kind of back in the same environment, mm -hmm. in the same predicament. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I know that I, I consciously, at times, choose between focusing in on things and not. And I'm, I'm really interested in that experience. When you were away from him, then there was just a little while when it felt safe. When I you was could driving. Perceive, yeah, when you were driving. You could perceive yourself and the whole situation, I guess. I could s perceive, it didn't have so much to do with, it, it did have to do with him. But I could perceive myself and my closed offedness. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was open. Mm -hmm. And I had that perception of myself and that awareness that I had been closed and that when I was driving through that canyon, I was feeling very open and now I could have my understanding and mm -hmm. it was all right. You let yourself, for that time, come out of the cave. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. it was great. Mm -hmm. And then he came to see me, flew in to see me a couple of weeks ago. And um, I felt, see, I was aware, I had this memory mm -hmm. of that opening up, mm -hmm. and so I felt more guarded. Oh, is that right? Uh -huh. But kind of slowly mm -hmm. unpeeling the layers, mm -hmm. or slowly coming out. But somehow having, having come out of the cave, you were afraid you might come out of the cave too easily. Mm, yeah, that's right. That's right. So watch out. Be careful. That's right. Hmm. Sound like a very tender, vulnerable part of you that lives in that cave. In my most tender part. Your most? My most tender part. Your most tender part. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's really a very mm -hmm. precious part of you that you keep in the cave. For a long, long time, <laughs> I've had the feeling of hopelessness, of ever coming out. And do you know, life is an existence without all of you. <laughs> without? Without all of you. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, you're, so you're, you're um, the hopelessness, I gather, is because you know you're not living with all of you. Part of you you're keeping well hidden. That's right. Well guarded. And it 
isn't really living unless you can live it with all of you. That's right. It's just doing things. Mm -hmm. Just doing things. The part that, you know, that I consciously avoid are the arts. Mm. Things that I love. Mm. Music, theater, mm -hmm. paintings, that kind of thing. So those are the things that so touch I don't your get feelings. To the core. Okay, things that touch your feelings or touch the core of you, those you want to stay away from. That's they, get, right. they get too close. Too close to this very tender part of you. You reached another stop. Mm -hmm. But you... But you felt safe enough to let out a little bit more. And now it's come to another stop. to give equal time to all of my dimensions. <laughs> yeah. We just, ha I just felt, you know, in touch with my vulnerability, but now I'm feeling angry. Okay. Like it's none of your business mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. What am I doing? Getting that close to the vulnerable part of you. Damn it, stay away. That's right. That's right. What do you want to do that for? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got other things to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're putting up all kinds of guards and against me and striking out. What the hell are you doing in, in so close to the vulnerable part of me? Why don't you go do something else? Hmm? Part that keeps me lonely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that that pushing away part, that kind of angry get away from me part, is what keeps you very lonely. It's like I don't really trust that. I can trust you to know that I can tell you this and that you, you may feel a little something about it, but <coughs> what then, you know? I mean, you know, it's mm -hmm. a nice story, mm -hmm. so big deal, something what else I, to do. What I hear in that is that you feel that I don't really care, just, just a story, just That's right. something. But what if I do you know, care? But what if I do care? I want to make a joke and say, I'll go on. <laughs> 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 you know, um, I'm a nurse, and a psychiatric nurse. Mm. Worked in psychiatric hospital last year. One of the big things there, the patients got a lot of points if they would talk in group. <laughs> I mean, t everybody wants you to talk, you know. That's what the good patients mm -hmm. talk. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, anybody can talk. The reason why people don't talk is not because they can't talk. It's because they don't know how people are going to respond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where it's at. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the patients were not being good patients. I don't think they were being bad patients because they weren't talking. I think that the staff could have a demerit for not responding, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. It's okay, these patients talk, mm -hmm. now how do you respond? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes it a whole new ball game. Yeah. And so now I talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I earned some points. <laughs> yeah, now I earned my points. 
That's true. But um, I think that's the fear of everyone. It's not mm -hmm. so much revealing themselves, but being cared about. Mm -hmm. It's my fear. Mm -hmm. It's my fear is after I reveal myself, I'm who gonna cares? Say it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, when you let out a tender part of yourself, then it's damned important to know, but does this other person care? Does it make any difference? My husband used to say he cared, but it was just words. It was words. He, um, I think he cared as much as he could care, but he had so many conflicts inside of himself that he didn't even see me as a person. Didn't even see me. It's not that he didn't want to care. Mm -hmm. If he couldn't, he was too busy with himself. But I understand that. And I understand that with other people, too. But see, I just can't go around revealing myself mm -hmm. all the time mm -hmm. to people mm -hmm. who are just too busy with themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need a response. You need a caring. You need to make a difference to somebody. Not to someone who'll say, oh, well, Kathy, I really care. And then I don't see him for a couple of years. Oh, I'll call you. And then they never call. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first split up for my husband, I would go to these different functions, not with a date, but with friends, and mm -hmm. meet a man and say, I'd call you. And for a while there, I'd be sure that I wasn't home because I couldn't stand to know if he didn't call. Mm -hmm. And that way, I didn't know if he didn't call. I mean, there was a possibility that he had yeah, called, no but I just, I wasn't home, so how could I know? Mm -hmm. So I was that, that, that vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I was really in touch with it. <coughs> Makes so much difference to you to know whether the other person is going to really respond when they see they care? Do That's they right. care? That's Caring people. They'll call you. Mm -hmm. They'll say, hello, drop by. How's it going? That kind of thing. And that's not enough. No, that would be enough if they would do that. I see. <laughs> That'd yeah. be just great. Okay. okay. <laughs> that would be just great. Hmm. I don't think I really want that much from another person. The morsels are fine, but I'm not even getting the morsels. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. It isn't as though you want a whole meal. It's the yeah, I mean, I could work up to it. Mm -hmm. all right. Mm -hmm. That's why I think with this friend who flew to see me, it was nice. And I may have gone back in, but I felt myself come alive a little bit. A little bit of magic mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. come into my life. Mm -hmm. and that was nice. And I'd rather not come out all at once mm -hmm. and run back in. I'd rather come out mm -hmm. bit by bit and stay out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But see, the thing of it is that, you know, like we're talking now a little bit, or I'm thinking about the focus of a relationship that has to be this male-female kind of thing. And um, I don't think I'm ready for that. I think what I, I need to do is to come out and be able to have love. And then think about a male-female relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how I can do come out too much without a man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of a dilemma. In a way. That's mm -hmm. a dilemma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you feel what you want first is a relationship with a person. Only it helps if it's a man. That's right. It must be a man. It isn't just better if it's a man. It, it that's a necessity. Be a man. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that's where my fear is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So that's where your fear is, a fear of the relationship with a man. And yet, you'd like to be able to really come out of the cave first before it became a man-woman of sexual relationship or anything like that. Is that what you're saying? I'd like to have a caring relationship. It's kind of funny. It's like a little girl wanting a man mm -hmm. to take her out of the cave mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and care about, I'll put it back on me, I feel like a little girl. Mm -hmm. Someone to care about me and to know that I'm comfortable and that I'm all right. And then ask for himself. And ask for himself, for himself. of mm -hmm. the relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But first, you'd like to have a man come at least to the entrance of the cave and take the hand of you as a little girl and lead you gently out, caring for you. And then maybe other kinds of things might happen. The little girl is the non-sexual mm -hmm. being. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Don't use me sexually first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then if you like it good enough, co keep coming back. Mm -hmm. That's what the I don't little, want. The little girl will grow up if you care enough for her. That's right. Mm -hmm. And can respond as a woman mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. the other is there. Can you tell him that? Could you tell him that? I'm confused. Do I tell one man that, or is this what I... I was thinking of this Oh, this individual? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think I could tell him that. I know mm -hmm. I could. But you know, I start putting them down. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that's just... My sister told me, she said, that's just because you're scared because I told her the kind of man I would, thought I would be comfortable with, and he is this kind of person. Mm -hmm. And then I start telling her all these bad things, and she said, nobody would be perfect. You would do this with anyone. So, but with this person, I think I could. Maybe you could let him know what you need. I'd like to be able to carry that over. I suppose maybe I'm, maybe I'm glossing that over or something, but I'd like to carry it over in my relationships with everyone, to get what I need from the relationship mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and not focusing in on the other person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See, I think the way I am, I'm the perfect nurse. Uh, the per uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. anything for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. I'm focusing on them anytime, mm -hmm. but on myself, you know, too scared to do that. Mm -hmm. so, and um, I like that's a no-no, but I'd like to be able to do that, focusing on my own needs first. But I feel kind of selfish mm. when, when I look at it that way. I feel like a taker instead of a giver. And that's got a negative connotation. You're so much a nurse that when you even think of saying, but I need this for myself, that seems kind of wrong, mm -hmm. selfish. Wait a minute, you know, yeah. you're the nurse. What is this? Mm -hmm. You're That's supposed right. to be caring for the other person. That's right. But once in a while you realize, I'd like to care for myself first. Seems awful. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just to say that. You're so just naughty just thinking <laughs> about it. Just to say that. Seems <laughs> what a selfish person I am. Yes. Terrible. Awful. I feel wicked, but I enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying thinking about it. <laughs> it's fun just to, just to imagine. Yeah. I might want something for myself first. It's in a really a lovely fantasy to be completely narcissistic.
<laughs> completely <laughs> self-centered mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. into pleasure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and into comfort. Mm -hmm. Just being good to yourself. But in a way, you know, in a way I am being good to myself by keeping that vulnerable part of me away until it's safe. Mm -hmm. Because not everybody would be good to you. Mm -hmm. Not everybody would be kind. There are people who would use you up and not bat an eyelash mm -hmm. and not even think about it. Mm -hmm. So you have a real respect for your for your instinct for preserving yourself. That's right. You can't trust everyone. Not everyone would would care. I was just smiling, I was thinking, but I care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And you say that with a smile, but that's pretty deep, too, isn't it? That mm -hmm. I do care. I, and I care like for caring. myself. Yeah, I like it. I like caring for myself. Mm -hmm. And not giving away every part of me. Mm -hmm. Just because some Tom, Dick, or Harry wants it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really prize myself, and I'm proud of that. I'm not going to just give myself away. That's right. Hmm. It's nice to have that feeling of caring for myself. That's good. But you know, since Dick died, I was thinking, you know, I could die tomorrow. Any of us could. Mm -hmm. And I'm missing. I want to have more. I don't want to just care for myself. I want to, I want to be able to care for myself and at the same time be able to take in life mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. that I'm not doing. Mm -hmm. See, I've closed it mm -hmm. off. I could figure out some way of doing that. Mm -hmm. Then you were smiling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Then that'd be just great. To be able to care for yourself and yet open yourself up to life. And somehow that's also tied in with the realization that, you know, death will come someday. You'd like that's to right. live before you die. That's right. I want, I saw a ca card one time, it says born and then died. And you open it up and it says, in in between he lived or something like that and that's what I would like for mm -hmm. myself a little mm -hmm. life in between the born and the death mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a little more life and a pleasure see that's what I'm missing deep down inside is the pleasure the experience of pleasure and joy those kind of experiences I mean happy I have fun. I do enjoy my children. Mm -hmm. But it's on a limited level. You don't really open yourself to, to joy. I guess fun, yes, sure. Mm -hmm. But the joy is on a deeper level, mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. so. I want to say, well, how you been lately? <laughs> <laughs> Let's change the subject. Yes. <laughs> How's your wife? <laughs> House? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. Be very nice to just run away from some of this. It just, would, just yes. Talk. Well, let's just have a rest for yeah. a while. <laughs> 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 I'm impressed with the fact that when you need a rest, you really take it. Oh, thank you. I was thinking my humor comes to the rescue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gives me a breather. Mm -hmm. It's 
one of the ways in which you preserve yourself. That's right. I had a dream one time, and I dreamed that I was on a sled with two other girls. They were going down a snowy hill, and they were going too fast. And I told them to stop. They had to get off. Otherwise, they were going to crash into this train station at the bottom of the hill, and they wouldn't believe me. So I got off, and they went on. And I sidestepped in the snow all the way down the hill. There were lots of trees where I was sidestepping, and I was hanging on to the trees one by one as I went down. And when I got to the bottom of the hill, the sled had crashed or something. So then I thought to myself, that means that has to do with me. Mm -hmm. Part of me would go too fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this morning has been an example of the fact that you're not going to go so fast that you crash. That's right. You're going to go at your own pace. If it's step by step down the hill, okay, that's the pace you have. It must be it. Maybe that's a good stopping point. I found it fascinating the way in which this client very slowly lowers her defenses. I think those defenses could be broken through, but that, in my estimation, would not be as helpful as letting her proceed at her own pace. I think the client learns more that way. We did see progress in the interview. We went from her perception of loneliness as her problem to her fear of her relationships with men to her feelings ab about letting the tender, vulnerable part of herself come out of a cave to the recognition of the little girl in her that wants to be tenderly let out. She then began to get to the recognition of the deep of the pain that is deep inside of her, that is unspeakable, almost unbearable. We saw her partially experience that pain in spots and then draw back. Then finally we saw the uh, feeling that she has that perhaps at bottom she is completely unlovable, one of the commonest feelings that people have. I thought that the dream at the end was almost a perfect description of the hour. She went deeper into herself step by step, by slow degrees, cautiously and guardedly, because she didn't want to crash into that pain. And she took resting times between the steps, so that I thought the dream described the whole progress of the hour. I feel that it was a working interview, not highly dramatic, and much of therapy is work, and this was a good example of it. I felt present to her. I felt a companion in her exploration. If I were to continue to see her, I think that she would gradually move toward experiencing that core of herself of which she is quite frightened. I like the way we got into metaphors. Clients can say more in metaphors than they can say, than they dare to say openly. And I liked the way I responded to the metaphors. I liked the way she was able to express her anger toward me, felt it, whenever she felt that she was getting close to a, a dangerous part of her experiencing, a painful part of her experiencing. And that was easy for me to accept that anger. I felt good about this as a first interview.